An Adventure with a Dog and a Glacier by John Muir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the summer of 1880, I set out from Fort Wrangell in a canoe with the Reverend S. H. Young, my former companion, and a crew of Indians to continue the exploration of the icy region of southeastern Alaska begun in the fall of 1879. After the necessary provisions, blankets, etc., had been collected and stowed away, and the Indians were in their places ready to dip their paddles, while a crowd of their friends were looking down from the wharf to bid them good-bye and good luck, Mr. Young, for whom we were waiting, at length came aboard, followed by a little black dog that immediately made himself at home by curling up in a hollow among the baggage. I like dogs, but this one seemed so small, dull, and worthless that I objected to his going, and asked the missionary why he was taking him. Such a helpless wisp of hair will only be in the way, I said. You had better pass him up to one of the Indian boys on the wharf to be taken home to play with his children. This trip is not likely to be a good one for toy dogs. He will be rained on and snowed on for weeks and will require care like a baby. But the missionary assured me that he would be no trouble at all, that he was a perfect wonder of a dog, could endure cold and hunger like a polar bear, could swim like a seal, and was wondrous wise, etc., making out a list of virtues likely to make him the most interesting of the company. Nobody could hope to unravel the lines of his ancestry. He was short-legged, bunchy-bodied, and almost featureless, something like a muskrat. Though smooth, his hair was long and silky so that when the wind was at his back it ruffled, making him look shaggy. At first sight his only noticeable feature was his showy tail, which was about as shady and airy as a squirrel's, and was carried curling forward nearly to his ears. On closer inspection you might see his thin, sensitive ears and his keen, dark eyes with cunning tan spots. Mr. Young told me that when the dog was about the size of a wood rat, he was presented to his wife by an Irish prospector at Sitka and that when he arrived at Fort Wrangell he was adopted by the Stikine Indians as a sort of good luck totem, and named Stikine for the tribe with whom he became a favorite. On our trip he soon proved himself a queer character, odd, concealed, independent, keeping invincibly quiet, and doing many inexplicable things that piqued my curiosity. Sailing week after week through the long, intricate channels and inlets among the innumerable islands and mountains of the coast, he spent the dull days in sluggish ease, motionless and apparently as unobserving as a hibernating marmot. But I discovered that somehow he always knew what was going forward. When the Indians were about to shoot at ducks or seals, or when anything interesting was to be seen along the shore, he would rest his chin on the edge of the canoe and calmly look out. When he heard us talking about making a landing, he roused himself to see what sort of place we were coming to, and made ready to jump overboard and swim ashore as soon as the canoe neared the beach. Then with a vigorous shake to get rid of the brine in his hair, he went into the woods to hunt small game. But though always the first out of the canoe, he was always the last to get into it. When we were ready to start, he could never be found, and refused to come to our call. We soon found out, however, that though we could not see him at such times, he saw us, and from the cover of the briars and the huckleberry bushes in the fringe of the woods was watching the canoe with wary eye. For as soon as we were fairly off, he came trotting down the beach, plunged into the surf, and swam after us, knowing well that we would cease rowing and take him in. When the contrary little vagabond came alongside, he was lifted by the neck, held at arm's length a moment to drip, and dropped aboard. We tried to cure him of this trick by compelling him to swim farther before stopping for him, but this did no good. The longer the swim, the better he seemed to like it. Though capable of most spacious idleness, he was always ready for excursions or adventures of any sort. When the Indians went into the woods for a deer, Stikeen was sure to be at their heels, provided I had not yet left camp. For though I never carried a gun, he always followed me, forsaking the hunting Indians and even his master to share my wanderings. The days that were too stormy for sailing I spent in the woods or on the mountains or glaciers, wherever I chanced to be, and Stikine always insisted on following me, gliding through the dripping huckleberry bushes and prickly panics and rubus tangles like a fox, scarce stirring their close-set branches, wading and wallowing through snow, swimming ice-cold streams, jumping logs and rocks, and the crusty hummocks and crevices of glaciers with the patience and endurance of a determined mountaineer, never tiring or getting discouraged. 
once he followed me over a glacier the surface of which was so rough that it cut his feet until every step was marked with blood but he trotted on with indian fortitude until i noticed his pain and taking pity on him made him a set of moccasins out of a handkerchief but he never asked help or made any complaint as if like a philosopher he had learned that without hard work and suffering there could be no pleasure worth having yet nobody knew what stickeen was good for he seemed to meet danger and hardships without reason insisted on having his own way never obeyed an order and the hunters could never set him on anything against his will or make him fetch anything that was shot i tried hard to make his acquaintance guessing there must be something in him but he was as cold as a glacier and about as invulnerable to fun though his master assured me that he played at home and in some measure conformed to the usages of civilization his equanimity was so immovable it seemed due to unfeeling ignorance let the weather blow and roar he was as tranquil as a stone and no matter what advances you made scarce a glance or a tail wag would you get for your pains no superannuated mastiff or bulldog grown old in office surpassed this soft midget in stoic dignity he sometimes reminded me of those plump squat unshakable cacti of the arizona deserts that give no sign of feeling a true child of the wilderness holding the even tenor of his hidden life with the silence and serenity of nature he never displayed a trace of the elfish vivacity and fun of the terriers and collies that we all know nor of their touching affection and devotion like children most small dogs beg to be loved and allowed to love but stickeen seemed a very diogenes asking only to be let alone he seemed neither old nor young his strength lay in his eyes they looked as old as the hills and as young and as wild i never tired looking into them it was like looking into a landscape but they were small and rather deep-set and had no explaining puckers around them to give out particulars i was accustomed to look into the faces of plants and animals and i watched the little sphinx more and more keenly as an interesting study but there is no estimating the wit and wisdom concealed and latent in our lower fellow mortals until made manifest by profound experiences for it is by suffering that dogs as well as saints are developed and made perfect after we had explored the glaciers of the Sumdum and Taku Inlets, we sailed through Stevens Passage into Lynn Canal, and thence through Icy Strait into Cross Sound, looking for unexplored inlets leading toward the ice fountains of the Fairweather Range. While the tide was in our favor in Cross Sound, we were accompanied by a fleet of icebergs drifting out to the ocean from Glacier Bay. Slowly we crawled around Vancouver's Point, Wimbledon, our frail canoe tossed like a feather on the massive swells coming in past Cape Spencer. For miles the sound is bound by precipitous cliffs which look terribly stern in gloomy weather. Had our canoe been crushed or upset, we could have gained no landing here, for the cliffs, as high as those of Yosemite, sink perfectly sheer into deep water. Eagerly we scanned the immense wall on the north side for the first sign of an opening all of us anxious except stickeen who dozed in peace or gazed dreamily at the tremendous precipices when he heard us talking about them at length we discovered the entrance of what is now called taylor bay and about five o'clock reached the head of it and encamped near the front of a large glacier which extends as an abrupt barrier all the way across from wall to wall of the inlet a distance of three or four miles on first observation the glacier presented some unusual features and that night i planned a great excursion for the morrow I awoke early, called not only by the glacier, but also by a storm. Rain mixed with trailing films of scud and the ragged, drawn-out nether surfaces of gray clouds filled the inlet and was sweeping forward in a thick, passionate, horizontal flood, as if it were all passing over the country instead of falling on it. Everything was streaming with life and motion, woods, rocks, waters, and the sky. The main perennial streams were booming, and hundreds of new ones born of the rain were descending in gray and white cascades on each side of the inlet, fairly streaking their rocky slopes, and roaring like the sea. I had intended making a cup of coffee before starting, but when I heard the storm I made haste to join it, for in storms nature has always something extra fine to show us, and if we have wit to keep in right relations with them, the danger is no more than in home-keeping, and we can go with them rejoicing, sharing their enthusiasm, and chanting with the old Norseman, the blast of the tempest aids our oars, the hurricane is our servant, and drives us whither we wish to go. So I took my ice-axe, buttoned my coat, put a piece of bread in my pocket, and set out. 
Mr. Young and the Indians were asleep, and so, I hoped, was Stikeen. But I had not gone a dozen rods before he left his warm bed in the tent and came boring through the blast after me. That a man should welcome storms for their exhilarating music and motion and go forth to see God making landscapes is reasonable enough. But what fascination could there be in dismal weather for this poor feeble wisp of a dog so pathetically small? Anyhow, on he came, breakfastless, through the choking blast. I stopped, turned my back to the wind, and gave him a good, dissuasive talk. "'Now don't!' I said, shouting to make myself heard in the storm. "'Now don't, Stickeen! What has got into your queer noodle now? You must be daft. This wild day has nothing for you. Go back to camp and keep warm. There is no game abroad, nothing but weather. Not a foot or wing is stirring. Wait, and get a good breakfast with your master, and be sensible for once. I can't feed you or carry you, and this storm will kill you. But nature, it seems, was at the bottom of the affair, and she gains her ends with dogs as well as with men, making us do as she likes, driving us on her ways however rough. So after ordering him back again and again to ease my conscience, I saw that he was not to be shaken off. As well might the earth try to shake off the moon. I had once led his master into trouble when he fell on one of the topmost jags of a mountain and dislocated his arms. Now the turn of his humble companion was coming. The dog just stood there in the wind, drenched and blinking, saying doggedly, Where thou goest, I will go. So I told him to come on, if he must, and gave him a piece of the bread I had put in my pocket for breakfast. Then we pushed on in company, and thus began the most memorable of all my wild days. The level flood, driving straight in our faces, thrashed and washed us wildly until we got into the shelter of the trees and ice cliffs on the east side of the glacier where we rested and listened and looked on in comfort. The exploration of the glacier was my main object, but the wind was too high to allow excursions over its open surface where one might be dangerously shoved while balancing for a jump on the brink of a crevasse. In the meantime the storm was a fine study. Here the end of the glacier, descending over an abrupt swell of resisting rock about five hundred feet high, leans forward and falls in majestic ice cascades. And as the storm came down the glacier from the north, Stikine and I were beneath the main current of the blast, while favorably located to see and hear it. A broad torrent, draining the side of the glacier, now swollen by scores of new streams from the mountains, was rolling boulders along its brocky channel between the glacier and the woods with thudding, bumping, muffled sounds, rushing towards the bay with tremendous energy as if in haste to get out of the mountains, the waters above and beneath calling to each other, and all to the ocean, their home. Looking southward from our shelter, we had this great torrent on our left, with mossy woods on the mountain slope above it, the glacier on our right, the wild cascading portion of it forming a multitude of towers, spires, and flat-top battlements, seen through the trees, and smooth gray gloom ahead. I tried to draw the marvelous scene in my notebook, but the rain fell on my page in spite of all that I could do to shelter it, and the sketch seemed miserably defective. When the wind began to abate, I traced the east side of the glacier. All the trees standing on the edge of the woods were barked and bruised, showing high ice mark in a very telling way, while tens of thousands of those that had stood for centuries on the bank of the glacier farther out lay crushed and being crushed. In many places I could see down fifty feet or so beneath the margin of the glacier mill, where trunks from one to two feet in diameter were being ground to pulp against outstanding rock ribs and bosses of the bank. About three miles above the front of the glacier I climbed to the surface of it by means of axe steps made easy for Stikine, and as far as the eye could reach the level or nearly level glacier stretched away indefinitely beneath the gray sky a seemingly boundless prairie of ice. The rain continued, which I did not mind, but a tendency to fogginess in the drooping clouds made me hesitate about venturing far from land. No trace of the west shore was visible, and in case the misty clouds should settle or the wind again become violent, I feared getting caught in a tangle of crevasses. Lingering undecided, watching the weather, I sauntered about on the crystal sea. For a mile or two out I found the ice remarkably safe. The marginal crevasses were mostly narrow, while a few wider ones were easily avoided by passing around them, and the clouds began to open here and there. 
Thus encouraged, I at last pushed out for the other side, for nature can make us do anything she likes, luring us along appointed ways for the fulfillment of her plans. At first we made rapid progress, and the sky was not very threatening, while I took bearings occasionally with a pocket compass to enable me to retrace my way more surely in case the storm should become blinding. But the structure lines of the ice were my main guide. Toward the west side we came to a closely crevassed section in which we had to make long, narrow tacks and doublings, tracing the edges of tremendous longitudinal crevasses, many of which were from twenty to thirty feet wide, and perhaps a thousand feet deep, beautiful, and awful. In working away through them I was severely cautious, but Stikine came on as unhesitatingly as the flying clouds. Any crevasse that I could jump he would leap without so much as halting to examine it. The weather was bright and dark, with quick flashes of summer and winter close together. When the clouds opened and the sun shone, the glacier was seen from shore to shore, with a bright array of encompassing mountains partly revealed, wearing the clouds as garments, black in the middle, burning on the edges, and the whole icy prairie seemed to burst into a bloom of iris colors from myriads of crystals. Then suddenly all the glorious show would be again smothered in gloom. But Stikine seemed to care for none of these things, bright or dark, nor for the beautiful wells filled to the brim with water so pure it was nearly invisible, the rumbling, grinding molans, or the quick-flashing, glinting, swirling streams and frictionless channels of living ice. Nothing seemed novel to him. He showed neither caution nor curiosity. His courage was so unwavering that it seemed due to dullness of perception, as if he were only blindly bold and I warned him that he might slip or fall short. His bunchy body seemed all one skipping muscle, and his peg legs appeared to be jointed only at the top. We gained the west shore in about three hours, the width of the glacier here being about seven miles. Then I pushed northward, in order to see as far back as possible into the fountains of the Fairweather Mountains, in case the clouds should rise. The walking was easy along the margin of the forest, which, of course, like that on the other side, had been invaded and crushed by the swollen glacier. In an hour we rounded a massive headland and came suddenly on another outlet of the glacier, which in the form of a wild ice cascade was pouring over the rim of the main basin toward the ocean with the volume of a thousand Niagaras. The surface was broken into a multitude of sharp blades and pinnacles, leaning forward, something like the up-dashing waves of a flood of water descending a rugged channel. But these ice waves were many times higher than those of river cataracts, and to all appearance motionless. It was a dazzling white torrent, two miles wide, flowing between high banks black with trees. Tracing its left bank three or four miles, I found that it discharged into a fresh water lake, filling it with icebergs. I would gladly have followed the outlet, but the day was waning, and we had to make haste on the return trip to get off the ice before dark. When we were about two miles from the west shore, the clouds dropped misty fringes, and snow soon began to fly. Then I began to feel anxiety as to finding a way in the storm through the intricate network of crevasses which we had entered. Stikine showed no fear. He was still the same silent, sufficient, uncomplaining Indian philosopher. When the storm darkness fell, he kept close behind me, the snow warned us to make haste, but at the same time hid our way. At rare intervals the clouds thinned and mountains, looming in the gloom, frowned and quickly vanished. I pushed on as best I could, jumping innumerable crevasses, and for every hundred rods or so of direct advance traveling a mile and doubling up and down in the turmoil of chasms and dislocated masses of ice. After an hour or two of this work we came to a series of longitudinal crevasses of appalling width like immense furrows. These I traced with firm nerve, excited and strengthened by the danger, making wide jumps, poising cautiously on the dizzy edges after cutting hollows from my feet before making the spring, to avoid slipping or any uncertainty on the farther sides, where only one trial is granted, exercise at once frightful and inspiring. Stikine flirted across every gap I jumped, seemingly without effort. Many a mile we thus traveled, mostly up and down, making but little real headway and crossing, most of the time running instead of walking, as the danger of spending the night in the glacier became threatening. No doubt we could have weathered the storm for one night, and I faced the chance of being compelled to do so. But we were hungry and wet, and the north wind was thick with snow and bitterly cold, 
and of course that night would have seemed a long one. Stikine gave me no concern. He was still the wonderful, inscrutable philosopher, ready for anything. I could not see far enough to judge in which direction the best route lay, and had simply to grope my way in the snow-choked air and ice. Again and again I was put to my mettle, but Stikine followed easily, his nerves growing more unflinching as the dangers thickened, so it always is with mountaineers. At length our way was barred by a very wide and straight crevasse, which I traced rapidly northward a mile or so, without finding a crossing or hope of one, then southward along the glacier about as far, to where it united with another crevasse. In all this distance of perhaps two miles there was only one place where I could possibly jump it, but the width of this jump was nearly the utmost I dared attempt, while the danger of slipping on the farther side was so great that I was loath to try it. Furthermore, the side I was on was about a foot higher than the other, and even with this advantage it seemed dangerously wide. One is liable to underestimate the width of crevasses where the magnitudes in general are great. I therefore measured this one again and again, until satisfied that I could jump it if necessary, but that in case I should be compelled to jump back to the higher side I might fail. Now a cautious mountaineer seldom takes a step on unknown ground which seems at all dangerous, that he cannot retrace in case he should be stopped by unseen obstacles ahead. This is the rule of mountaineers who live long, and though in haste I compelled myself to sit down and deliberate before I broke it. Retracing my devious path in imagination as if it were drawn on a chart, I saw that I was recrossing the glacier a mile or two farther upstream, and was entangled in a section I had not before seen. Should I risk this dangerous jump? or try to regain the woods on the west shore, make a fire, and have only hunger to endure while waiting for a new day. I had already crossed so broad a tangle of dangerous ice that I saw it would be difficult to get back to the woods through the storm, while the ice just beyond the present barrier seemed more promising, and the east shore was now perhaps about as near as the west. I was therefore eager to go on, but this wide jump was a tremendous obstacle. At length, because of the dangers already behind me, I determined to venture against those that might be ahead, jumped, and landed well, but with so little to spare that I more than ever dreaded being compelled to take that jump back from the lower side. Stikine followed, making nothing of it, but within a distance of a few hundred yards we were stopped again by the widest crevasse yet encountered. Of course I made haste to explore it, hoping all yet might be well. About three-fourths of a mile upstream it united with the one we had just crossed, as I feared it would. Then tracing it down I found it joined the other great crevasse at the lower end, maintaining a width of forty to fifty feet. We were on an island about two miles long and from one hundred to three hundred yards wide, with two barely possible ways of escape, one by the way we came, the other by an almost inaccessible sliver bridge that crossed the larger crevasse from near the middle of the island. After tracing the brink I ran back to the sliver bridge and cautiously studied it. Crevasses caused by strains from variations of the rate of motion of different parts of the glacier, and by convexities in the channel, are mere cracks when they first open, so narrow as hardly to admit the blade of a pocket knife, and widen gradually according to the extent of the strain. Now some of these cracks are interrupted like the cracks in wood, and opening the strip of ice between overlapping ends is dragged out and if the flow of the glacier there is such that no strain is made on the sliver, it maintains a continuous connection between the sides, just as the two sides of a slivered crack in wood that is being split are connected. Some crevasses remain open for years, and by the melting of their sides continue to increase in width long after the opening strain has ceased, while the sliver bridges, level on top at first and perfectly safe, are at length melted to thin, knife-edged blades the upper portion being most exposed to the weather, and since the exposure is greatest in the middle, they at length curve downward like the cables of suspension bridges. This one was evidently very old, for it had been wasted until it was the worst bridge I ever saw. The width of the crevasse was here about fifty feet, and the sliver, crossing diagonally, was about seventy feet long, was depressed twenty-five or thirty feet in the middle, and the upper curving ends were attached to the sides eight or ten feet below the surface of the glacier. Getting down the nearly vertical wall to the end of it and up the other side were the main difficulties, and they seemed all but insurmountable. Of the many perils encountered in my years of wandering in mountain altitudes, none seemed so plain and stern and merciless as this. And it was presented when we were wet to the skin and hungry. The sky was dark with snow and the night near, 
and we had to fear the snow in our eyes and the disturbing action of the wind and any movement we might make. But we were forced to face it. It was a tremendous necessity. Beginning not immediately above the sunken end of the bridge, but a little to one side, I cut nice hollows on the brink for my knees to rest in, then leaning over with my short-handled axe, cut a step sixteen or eighteen inches below, which on account of the sheerness of the wall was shallow. That step, however, was well made, its floor sloped slightly inward, and formed a good hold for my heels. Then, slipping cautiously upon it, and crouching as low as possible, with my left side twisted toward the wall, I steadied myself with my left hand in a slight notch, while with the right I cut other steps and notches in succession, guarding against glinting of the axe, for life or death was in every stroke, and in the niceness of finish of every foothold. After the end of the bridge was reached, it was a delicate thing to poise on a little platform which I had chipped on its upcurving end, and bending over the slippery surface get astride of it. Crossing was easy, cutting off the sharp edge with careful strokes and hitching forward a few inches at a time, keeping my balance with my knees pressed against its sides. The tremendous abyss on each side I studiously ignored. The surface of that blue sliver was then all the world. But the most trying part of the adventure was, after working my way across inch by inch, to rise from the safe position astride that slippery strip of ice, and to cut a ladder in the face of the wall, chipping, climbing, holding on with feet and fingers in mere notches. At sometimes one's whole body is eye, and common skill and fortitude are replaced by power beyond our call or knowledge. Never before had I been so long under deadly strain. How I got up the cliff at the end of the bridge I never could tell. The thing seemed to have been done by somebody else. I never have had contempt of death, though in the course of my explorations I oftentimes felt that to meet one's fate on a mountain, in a grand canyon, or in the heart of a crystal glacier, would be blessed, as compared with death from disease, a mean accident in a street, or from a sniff of sewer gas. But the sweetest, cleanest death set thus calmly and glaringly clear before us is hard enough to face, even though we feel gratefully sure that we have already had happiness enough for a dozen lives. But poor Stikeen, the wee, silky, sleek beastie, think of him. When I had decided to try the bridge, and while I was on my knees cutting away the rounded brow, he came behind me, pushed his head past my shoulder, looked down and across, scanned the sliver and its approaches with his queer eyes, then looked me in the face with a startled air of surprise and concern, and began to mutter and whine, saying as plainly as if speaking with words, "'Shortly you are not going to try that awful place.' This was the first time I had seen him gaze deliberately into a crevasse or into my face with a speaking look. That he should have recognized and appreciated the danger at the first glance showed wonderful sagacity. Never before had the quick, daring midget seemed to know that ice was slippery, or that there was such a thing as danger anywhere. His looks and the tones of his voice when he began to complain and speak his fears were so human that I unconsciously talked to him as I would to a boy, and in trying to calm his fears, perhaps in some measure, moderated my own. "'Hush your fears, my boy,' I said. "'We will get across safe, though it is not going to be easy.' No right way is easy in this rough world. We must risk our lives to save them. At the worst we can only slip, and then how grand a grave we shall have! And by and by our nice bones will do good in the terminal moraine. But my sermon was far from reassuring him. He began to cry, and after taking another piercing look at the tremendous gulf, ran away in desperate excitement, seeking some other crossing. By the time he got back, baffled, of course, I had made a step or two. I dared not look back, but he made himself heard, and when he saw that I was certainly crossing, he cried aloud in despair. The danger was enough to daunt anybody, but it seemed wonderful that he should have been able to weigh and appreciate it so justly. No mountaineer could have seen it more quickly or judged it more wisely, discriminating between real and apparent peril. After I had gained the other side, he howled louder than ever and after running back and forth in vain search for a way of escape, he would return to the brink of the crevasse above the bridge, moaning and groaning, as if in the bitterness of death. Could this be the silent, philosophic Stikeen? I shouted encouragement, telling him the bridge was not so bad as it looked, that I had left it flat for his feet, and that he could walk it easily. But he was afraid to try it. 
Strange that so small an animal should be capable of such big, wise fears. I called again and again in a reassuring tone to come on and fear nothing, that he could come if he would only try. Then he would hush for a moment, look again at the bridge, and shout his unshakable conviction that he could never, never come that way, then lie back in despair as if howling, Oh, what a place! No, I can never go down there! His natural composure and courage had vanished utterly in a tumultuous storm of fear. Had the danger been less, his distress would have seemed ridiculous. But in this gulf, a huge, yawning sepulchre big enough to hold everybody in the territory, lay the shadow of death, and his heart-rending cries might well have called heaven to his help. Perhaps they did. So hidden before, he was transparent now, and one could see the workings of his mind like the movements of a clock out of its case. His voice and gestures were perfectly human, and his hopes and fears unmistakable, while he seemed to understand every word of mine. I was troubled at the thought of leaving him. It seemed impossible to get him to venture. To compel him to try by fear of being left, I started off as if leaving him to his fate, and disappeared back of a hummock. But this did no good, for he only laid down and cried. So after hiding a few minutes, I went back to the brink of the crevasse, and in a severe tone of voice shouted across to him that now I must certainly leave him. I could wait no longer, and that if he would not come, all I could promise was that I would return to seek him next day. I warned him that if he went back to the woods, the wolves would kill him, and finished by urging him once more by words and gestures to come on. He knew very well what I meant and at last with a courage of despair hushed and breathless he lay down on the brink in the hollow i had made for my knees pressed his body against the ice to get the advantage of the friction gazed into the first step put his little feet together and slid them slowly down into it bunching all four in it and almost standing on his head then without lifting them as well as i could see through the snow he slowly worked them over the edge of the step and down into the next and the next in succession in the same way and gained the bridge then lifting his feet with a regularity and slowness of the vibrations of a second's pendulum as if counting and measuring one two three holding himself in dainty pose and giving separate attention to each little step he gained the foot of the cliff at the top of which i was kneeling to give him a lift should he get within reach here he halted in dead silence and it was here i feared he might fail for dogs are poor climbers i had no cord if i had had one i would have dropped a noose over his head and hauled him up but while i was thinking whether an available cord might be made out of clothing he was looking keenly into the series of notched steps and finger holes on the ice ladder i had made as if counting them and fixing the position of each one in his mind. Then suddenly up he came with a nervy, springy rush, hooking his paws into the notches and stepped so quickly that I could not see how it was done, and whizzed past my head, safe at last. And now came a scene. Well done, well done, little boy, brave boy, I cried, trying to catch and caress him. But he would not be caught. Never before or since have I seen anything like so passionate a revulsion from the depths of despair to uncontrollable, exultant, triumphant joy. He flashed and darted hither and thither as if fairly demented, screaming and shouting, swirling round and round in giddy loops and circles like a leaf in a whirlwind, lying down and rolling over and over sideways and heels over head, pouring forth a tumultuous flood of hysterical cries and sobs and gasping mutterings. And when I ran up to him to shake him, fearing he might die of joy, he flashed off two or three hundred yards, his feet in a mist of motion. Then turning, suddenly he came back in wild rushes and launched himself at my face, almost knocking me down, all the time screeching and screaming and shouting as if saying, Saved! 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 Then back away, dropping suddenly at times with his feet in the air, trembling and fairly sobbing. Such passionate emotion was enough to kill him. Moses' stately song of triumph after escaping the Egyptians in the Red Sea was nothing to it. Who could have guessed the capacity of the dull, enduring little fellow for all that most stirs this mortal frame? Nobody could have helped crying with him. But there is nothing like work for toning down either excessive fear or joy. So I ran ahead, calling him, in as gruff a voice as I could command, to come on and stop his nonsense, for we had far to go, and it would soon be dark. Neither of us feared another trial like this. Heaven would surely count one enough for a lifetime. 
The ice ahead was gashed by thousands of crevasses, but they were common ones. The joy of deliverance burned in us like fire, and we ran without fatigue, every muscle with immense rebound, glorying in its strength. Stikine flew across everything in his way, and not till dark did he settle into his normal fox-like gliding trot. At last the mountains crowned with spruce came in sight, looming faintly in the gloaming, and we soon felt the solid rock beneath our feet, and were safe. Then came weariness. We stumbled down along the lateral moraine in the dark, over rocks and tree trunks, through the bushes and devil club thickets and mossy logs and boulders of the woods where we had sheltered ourselves in the morning, then out on the level mud slope of the terminal moraine. Danger had vanished, and so had our strength. We reached camp about ten o'clock and found a big fire and a big supper. A party of Huna Indians had visited Mr. Young, bringing a gift of porpoise meat and wild strawberries, and Hunter Joe had brought in a wild goat. But we lay down, too tired to eat much, and soon fell into a troubled sleep. The man who said, the harder the toil, the sweeter the rest, never was profoundly tired. Stikine kept springing up and muttering in his sleep, no doubt dreaming that he was still on the brink of the crevasse, and so did I. That night, and many others, long afterward, when I was nervous and overtired, Thereafter, Stikine was a changed dog. During the rest of the trip, instead of holding aloof, he would come to me at night, when all was quiet around the campfire, and rest his head on my knee with a look of devotion as if I were his god. And often, as he caught my eye, he seemed to be trying to say, Wasn't that an awful time we had together on the glacier? None of his old friends know what finally became of him. When my work for the season was done, I departed for California, and never saw the dear little fellow again. Mr. Young wrote me that in the summer of 1883 he was stolen by a tourist at Fort Wrangell and taken away on a steamer. His fate is wrapped in mystery. If alive, he is very old. Most likely he has left this world, crossed the last crevasse, and gone to another. But he will not be forgotten. Come what may, to me, Stakeen is immortal. End of an Adventure with a Dog in a Glacier by John Muir Read by Winston Tharp